everyone. Thanks for joining. We'll get officially started in a moment. All right, good, let's get started. Good evening, welcome to PNP Live. My name is Margaret Orto and I'm the events coordinator in the children and teens department at Politics and Prose. Thank you for joining us tonight for our event with co-authors Henry Winkler and Lynn Oliver in conversation with Jake Tapper to celebrate the publication of Lights, Camera, Danger, the second book in their Alien Superstar series. A few announcements. Tonight, we'll drop the book purchase link for the Alien Superstar books into the book chat during this conversation. And again, we have book one and book two available. Uh, also tonight, audience members can ask questions, can ask a question by clicking Q&A located at the bottom of your screen. You can also upvote on a question that you'd like to see answered. At the end of the conversation, we'll get to as many audience questions as possible. Please remember that this is a creative safe space and we ask that attendees be respectful of one another and any questions and comments. Now for the event you're waiting for. Henry Winkler is an Emmy award winning actor, writer, director and producer with over four decades of success in Hollywood. He has created some of the most iconic TV roles including The Fonz and Happy Days and Gene Cousineau and Barry. He is the co-author with Lynn Oliver of the smash hit Hank Zipser, Here's Hank series that chronicles the misadventures of an elementary school student with dyslexia that is based on Winkler's own childhood experience. He is also the co-author with Lynn Oliver of the Alien Superstar series. Lynn Oliver is a writer and producer of movies, books, and television series for children and families. She is currently the executive director of the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, a worldwide organization of over 25,000 members. She is also the author of over 40 books, including the Fantastic Frame and the Who Shrunk Daniel Funk series. Oliver is the co-author of the Hank Zipser, Here's Hank and Alien Superstars books. The authors will be in conversation tonight with Jake Tapper, who is, who is CNN's chief Washington correspondent. He is the anchor of the lead with Jake Tapper and hosts the Sunday morning news show, State of the Union. He is the author of several books, including the Hellfire Club, the Outpost and Untold Story of American Valor, and Down and Dirty, The Plot to Steal the Presidency. And now I'd like to turn it over to Henry Lynn and Jake, take it away. Thank it's you. So, uh, such an honor to be here. Um, I'm gonna lead the conversation with Henry and Lynn, if that's okay. And uh, thank you so much. And thanks to Pennsylvania for ending the presidential contest so I could be here tonight. Um, <laughs> Henry, let me start with you, if that's okay. Um, your previous books are realistic fiction, um, but this is sci-fi fantasy. Uh, what made you decide to make the jump with the, the new book and the, and the previous one in the series? Well, the, what, is, what is interesting is that they're, all of them are comedies first. Uh, because we think that comedy is the, the, the gateway to the reluctant reader, uh, to the, uh, the young boys uh, reader. Um, and what is interesting, it, and I, we just figured this out uh, in our last session together before COVID, was that all of our characters, no matter who they are, are always on the outside looking to get in. They're always a little bit the stranger in a strange land and an alien is the perfect example of that. We knew that uh, children like aliens, they like outer space and they also love the, they're fascinated by stardom about working in Hollywood. So we, we know Hollywood, we don't know aliens as well, but we just put them together. And, and Lynn, um, what experiences from your time in Hollywood, if any, did you draw on and, and put in this book? And then Henry, same question for you after Lynn answers. Well, I think Henry and I both drew on our experiences. His are in front of the camera and mine are behind the camera. So I was essentially a writer, producer, executive producer of half hour situation comedies. And in this book, our alien hero, Buddy Berger, is the star of a half an hour situation comedy that's actually shot at Universal Studios on stage 42. 
and I shot a show that I produced called Harry the Hendersons on stage 42 at Universal Studios. So we used a lot of our experiences in terms of the excitement of doing a television show, the, the, uh, the conflicts of doing a television show, what fame means, both in terms of its upside and its downsides. Henry could certainly speak to that because he, he's experienced both sides. And just to sort of demystify the, the, what it is to make a television show. It seems really glamorous, but those of us who have done it know that it's a lot of hard work and uh, stale donuts. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I, I don't have much to add to that. Uh, it, it is uh, the, the idea that you need friendship, the idea that you need collaboration in order to make anything, and especially a television show, uh, because uh, as with uh, uh, even America, um, united we stand and um, divided we fall. And it's the same in making television. If the actors are not uh, committed to the whole, to the show itself, uh, that eventually will eat away at the foundation. And Lynn, what is, what is the process that you work through both in terms of collaborating with Henry and also uh, in terms of outlining uh, versus just plunging in? Uh, I know yeah. that there are lots of different kinds of theories about, about the writing process. Um, you know, some people are architects, some people, I think it was George R. R. Martin who said some people are, some are architects, they, they, they format everything, they say what they're gonna do, outline everything. Some are gardeners, they just let it grow and bloom. Where are you and, and how do you and Henry collaborate? Right, well, in children's books, we have a slightly less elegant way of saying that than, than uh, George R. R. Martin. We say there, there are plotters and pantsers. And plotters are the people who outline and they're the architects. And the pantsers are people who fly by the seat of their pants with the plot. Henry is a pantser and I'm a plotter. So it's a very good collaboration because it means that we start someplace. We start with an architecture, with an armature, with an, uh, with an architecture. And then depending on where the story takes us and when the characters start to speak to us, we're, we're willing to make a left turn and sometimes that just takes us on a little on a little detour, and sometimes it takes us way off into outer space. Henry loves those moments. For me, I get a rash. <laughs> they give me a rash. <laughs> but it is true. Uh, Lynn has taught me all of the the rules of writing because I've never ever written before, and that's um, her her life. And uh, we start with uh, Lynn demands that we start with a an outline. And so we work it out and we figure it out. And all of a sudden, by itself, the book starts to go on a journey. <laughs> and then we are smart enough to go with it. And we've ended up with 35 novels. <laughs> can you, Lynn, Lynn, can you give us an example? I, I know this process well, because I'm, I'm both uh, a, a, a plotter and a pantser. When I write my novels, uh, I'm writing my second one. And I, I have, a, I have a, an outline. And then I, I try to stick with it, but then it, it does tend to take on a life of its own, especially but after the first draft in, in the second draft, then I start, well, this, this is so much better. And I just start running that, that direction. Can you give us an example, Lynn, of, of either in this series or, or, or any other? Oh, I can give you a thousand examples. Uh, there, I think it was so, I think it was Vladimir Nabokov who said that a writer should, should wear out his eraser before the point of the pencil, because writing is really about revision and rewriting. So we start out entirely sure that we have the plot down. And then halfway through, it starts not to exactly make sense or we've taken a left turn somewhere. So <laughs> in, in this case, when, when our main character is an alien who comes from a far away red dwarf planet and lands on earth, and he lands on the back lot of Universal Studios where he certainly, it's the place he is least likely to be a stranger in a strange land, because what could be stranger than Hollywood? Um, so we knew that was our premise, but we didn't actually know where we were going to go from there because we thought that would sustain us. Well, it turns out that that was funny, but then we needed to add plot elements. So rather than revising, we thought, what's the danger here? Well, the danger is that he's going to get discovered 
like in the great movie E.T. when he gets discovered and the FBI and the government forces come in and, and want to put him in a cage. He gets pursued by someone from his planet. We had never really intended that. But in the second book, the one that, that we're talking about tonight, we thought we need more adventure. We need, so we created a character who was gonna come from their planet to pursue him. And then we thought, well, she was a little dull. So we made her a shapeshifter, someone who could inhabit someone else's body. Mm -hmm. I don't think when we were doing the outline, we ever had any concept of her as that, did we Henry? No, as a shapeshifter. No. Uh, and and uh, she could also take on, uh, she was the, the gas company man and she was a fan in a, at a party. And, uh, you know, she, and literally just, be, and oh, she also became one, well, I shouldn't tell you this, but she became one of the cast members of wow. this situational comedy who now she's infiltrated his world. Uh, and it gets very exciting. Jake, Henry, I'm, wondering, you... oh, I'm wondering if you find out when, when you're writing, that you, you think you're doing great work and you're writing along and then you take a minute to go back and read the chapters and you think, maybe not so much. Maybe, maybe this needs a little bit more or more tension. Do you find that? Yeah, you know, the difference between the first draft of the, of, the, of the novel I'm finishing up right now and the second draft, I handed in the first draft and I was, I was not happy with it. I mean, I was happy that I had finished the first draft but I was not happy with it and um, but by the time I, that, then I just, you know, spent a month marinating and thinking about it and thinking about ways to improve it and getting feedback from a lot of people. I showed it to a lot of people. Um, and now I feel much, much better. And I, I think it's just, it was just shot up, but like, it's a lot of work. And one of the toughest parts about writing I find um, is, is, is just the work. It's just like, you have, you have this, it's a, it's a problem. You have a problem in front of you. The problem is the first draft of your book and you want to make it into a great second draft. Um, and getting it down on paper for that first draft, it's important, but it's honestly, to me, it's like lugging in a huge thing of clay. That's the first draft. Making it into something that looks good, that's the second draft. That's been my experience. Right. Anyway, Henry, how did you and Lynn, how did you and Lynn meet? We met because there was a lull in my acting career and uh, a mutual friend uh, said, oh, I'm gonna introduce you to Lynn who knows a lot about children's literature. Uh, and I said, but I can't write a book. He said, you know, just go to lunch with Lynn. Uh, and I, I told Lynn the story of my uh, dyslexic life in school failing everything and Lynn heard it and said, you know what? Uh, I think there's a story there. We put together a proposal. Uh, uh, my agent uh, sent it out to um, five publishers. One said no, uh, oh, one said no, one said maybe. Uh, and then one said, you know what? Uh, we'll give you a contract for four novels uh, and see what happens. And it turned into 28. That's but great, but what, it was, what is it was, amazing it was, is that when yeah. we're writing, when we're finished, before we send it in, uh, we read it out loud to each other. Lynn is a better reader than I am because it's hard for me to read off the page. But as we're reading it, it all of a sudden the red pencil goes flying across <laughs> the page. It just presents itself um, so clearly and when we're done, I am still uh, amazed that we have this book that a few months ago didn't exist. The page, the screen on, on Lynn's computer was empty. And now there's this thing. Oh my goodness. And, and Lynn, give us your version of, uh, of how you met, of your, of your meat story. Well, my version is that we were set up in a lunch. We ate at a restaurant where there was a really terrible fish plate. That's <laughs> my first recollection. And Henry pushed his food around on the plate for an hour. But during that time, he told me the story of his childhood, which was, was, a, was the childhood of feeling very failed because he was bad in school, because he was dyslexic. And he was 
undiagnosed dyslexic. And I was so touched by that, that here a person who was really an icon and the top of his profession still was remembering what it felt like to be in third grade and flunk the spelling test. You know, we don't recover from childhood. You know, we're all taught to believe that childhood is this blissful time of innocence, but it's a, it can be a very painful time and kids struggle with the same self-esteem issues that adults struggle with. So I was so touched by that and so moved by that, that I thought, this is a hero, this is, we need to create a hero out of this character, out of a flawed character that kids, one in five kids in America has a learning difference. So if it's not you, it's the kid sitting next to you or the kid sitting next to that kid. So the idea of being able to do a funny series about a kid who was deeply flawed was just so such an opportunity for me. And Henry is so articulate about those feelings. They apparently haven't left him from the time he was seven or eight years old. So they're, they're very present in our books. Henry, uh, where did you grow up? I grew up in Manhattan, West Side, uh, on the, the same apartment Hank Zipser lived in. I went to PS 87 uh, down the street. I, I literally could walk uh, to school. Um, uh, and uh, then I went to McBurney School for Boys uh, and fail. I, I'm in the bottom 3% academically. My favorite story is that I took geometry for four years, same course, regular school and summer school. And that I passed it in uh, uh, August of 1963. And from that day with the D minus, um, and, and I was allowed to go to college, if I didn't pass it, I was out. Uh, from that day until tonight, no one has ever said hypotenuse to me. <laughs> 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 that's, that's funny. So, so Buddy, the alien, experiences um, struggle uh, yes. with acceptance. Uh, what happens? What happens if people find out who I am? Will yeah. they still accept me? Uh, how important is friendship versus uh, your your career? Uh, where is the balance? Uh, body shaming. All of that is woven into the fabric of the comedy, but on, on the surface, uh, if we don't laugh, it doesn't go in. Right, right. And I think it's so insightful, Lynn, what Henry said about, I have an 11 year old boy and a 13 year old girl. And um, the 13 year old has been, she's just a ravenous reader. But the 11 year old boy, he's super smart, but he's just, it's, he's just not that into it. It's just not his yep. thing. And, the books that um, that he's been into have been the funny books, the amusing yeah. books. It's been uh, your books, but also Dog Man, also Captain Underpants. You know, anything yeah. anything that makes him laugh. It's it's such a it's such a great insight that that's the the gateway to reading for especially for little boys. Can I well, I'm the question? mother Isn't of your daughter, a writer. She wrote a book. Yeah, she wrote a book yeah. about uh, the importance importance of girls raising their hand in class. It was a, it was a kid's book that came out a, a year or two ago. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's a great theme. But we, we say, take those eight to 12 year old boys and send them to us and we will, we will make them readers. I'm the mother of three sons. So I grew up with uh, bribery. You know, I'll pay you a penny a page to read. <laughs> I'll buy you a Lego set if you just read two more chapters. You yes. know? It's, it's so, the key, it's the key to parenting. Bribery. Yeah, you, you are not you are not alone in that. So the one trick that we discovered is, especially for boys, if there are two gateways into their reading habits. One is comedy, the lower comedy, the better. Yeah. And the other is to scare them. They like to be scared and they like to laugh. So yeah. we're not so good at scary, but we're very good at funny. So all of our books are funny first. And we have so many parents tell us, my child is not a reader, but I I got him one of your books and I was walking by his bedroom and I heard him laughing and I looked in and he had a book in his hand. Do you know what that does to parents? You think, oh, I've, so I've succeeded, I've, I've done it, I can do it now. <laughs> the Wimpy Kid books also, I should mention. Yeah, are, absolutely. Are another one. Yeah, he's a good uh, friend of ours. He's yeah, no, I saw so he, 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 he praised your book. He, you have one of the, yeah, one of the he's blurbs. He's such a lovely human being. He's, he is the kindest. 
A Hollywood adventure that's truly out of this world. The alien superstar has it all, action, suspense, and big laughs from Jeff Kinney. Um, let me take some of that. We have some questions here from, from our, uh, our folks here. Um, and uh, this is, okay, so uh, Tissa uh, asks you, Henry, how did you overcome your dyslexia when learning your acting lines? It's a good question. Okay, so here's the thing. You never overcome your dyslexia. You only learn to negotiate it. You learn to work with it. Uh, I would get my scripts, I still do to this day, even with Barry. I get my scripts as early as I can. I go over them as often as I can. Because when, we, when I first started on Happy Days, we would read around a table, uh, and we've written this into the novel, of course, but we would sit around a table, the producer, the directors, the actors, and then all the, the department heads, costumes, props and everything, so they could hear what was going to go on this week. I couldn't read off the page. And I would stumble all the time and not know exactly why. I just knew I always had a, a problem, but it was so embarrassing and I would cover it with humor. Uh, if, if I made a mistake, I would ad lib, but that's how, uh, that's how I, uh, I do it. I, I work a little harder and it's worth it. That's fascinating. Um, and it reminds me also, by the way, and I, I, we don't want this to be a, a political event, obviously, but, but you and most of the cast of Happy Days, um, uh, recently did an event for the Wisconsin Democrats to raise money. Uh, and so I should say at the very least, congratulations on Wisconsin. Uh, obviously your efforts paid off and the, <laughs> and Milwaukee and the Milwaukee suburbs went big. So, um, you know, even if our viewers aren't uh, a fan necessarily of Mr. Biden or wh however they feel, uh, congratulations on that. What, what did you but want? I, I will tell you, Jake, you talked about, uh, you wanted to find if you had sexism in your, uh, in your book and you weed it out, you know, by giving it to people to read. When we were reading the scripts of Happy Days, we read two original scripts of Happy Days. Yeah. I thought, oh my God, I could <laughs> never say that now. <laughs> oh Lord. It's, it was, pretty I mean, incredible. it was really it's funny. funny to discover. It was pretty, I, I, the other day I was, um, I wanted to show my kids Manch because the defining shows of the 70s for me were Happy Days, The Six Million Dollar Man, and MASH. Um, and uh, yeah, you can't, they're, they're all of them completely sexist. Just every single, just now at the, in your defense, your show took place in the 50s. Yes, so I mean. But, but still, holy moly. <laughs> that, it was really, it was, as I was reading, I go, Ooh. Yeah, no. <laughs> Quite a thing, quite a thing. Uh, let me read some more questions here from uh, from our our folks. Um, how did you, did Lynn? Let me ask you this one, and then we'll, and then Henry can can uh, do it too. Uh, how did you keep this story running for all twenty eight books? Obviously, that's not about uh, Buddy. It's about uh, Hank. Howard. It's about Hank Sipser. Yeah, Hank. it's about Hank Sipser. Yeah, yeah. Well. Here's the thing, Henry and I both come out of series television. And what you're aiming for in series television is a long run. So when you have a concept, you, your proof of concept, your test is that there are many points of entry into the story that you can generate lots of stories. So when Henry and I have an idea for a book series, we put it through that test and we sit together and say, well, what are some stories that could come out of that? And if we can, if we can just cough up two or three, we think, Mm, this isn't this isn't good. But if the stories just come pouring out naturally, that from the from not only our main character but from the cast of characters, then you know you have a series. So it's 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 a real problem, and we test for it before we undertake a a series. You know uh, what I always loved is, first of all, we took from our children's fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade uh, life, our life. Uh, but we would sit, I sit opposite Lynn in her office, uh, and we, we start a story. Hey, how about if he did this? And then this hap literally happens. Uh, well, uh, he could, uh, and then we throw that story out <laughs> or 
we come up with an idea. All right, they go overnight and they sleep on a tall ship down in San Diego. And in New York, it was in uh, on the Hudson River. Okay, he can do this. And then this happens. And then all of a sudden they eat an onion and then all of it, and he unties the boat and he can't put it back together. And the boat sails off and now they have to check. And then we know we've got a story. <laughs> what made you decide, uh, Henry and Lynn, Henry then Lynn, uh, to do uh, this book about the alien? Because you have a very successful series already going. Why? Why start? Ah, ah, yes. You know, we decided <laughs> not. <laughs> we decided not to do Hank anymore when the publisher called and said, "I think that's it." Oh, I, think, <laughs> I think we're not going to do anymore. I think that we've done, uh, uh, you know, 18 of Hank Zipser, and then we moved him to the second grade. We moved him backwards, and we did 12, and they went, "Okay, time's up." So we immediately. Uh, thought of the uh, uh, the alien, the uh, the stranger in a strange land, uh, and we were able to. We had meetings uh, with every children's publisher, and a lot of people said yes. But Abrams really uh, enjoyed the story, and they have been unbelievably supportive of us. Abrams is great. Good yeah. people, really good people. I met I met him at a. Uh, at a cartoon convention and he's mm -hmm. such, such a such a kind guy with such great just love of love of Books. the work yeah, yeah. their their uh, their motto what it says under their logo is the art of books and that was one of the reasons we were excited about it because one thing we didn't mention is that alien superstar is full of illustrations yeah also thinking of those boys uh who read wimpy kid and 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 the whole upswing now in graphic novels i don't know if your son is into that but all yeah, the kids are reading definitely. graphic novels daughter too so while this isn't a graphic novel it's heavily illustrated middle grade fiction so there are 50 60 70 illustrations within a book and so it makes it if you think about it and you think well i'm nine years old or ten years old and i haven't been reading for all that long and now i have 200 pages to read it's kind of a daunting thought so if you could break it up with shorter chapters or illustrations and comedy, it makes it, it makes, what we want is for reading to be pleasurable. We're not the school book, you know, we're not textbooks, right. we're not curriculum, we're not, it's we're not deeply, it's yes, joy. Yeah. we want you know, to be the well, book that you sneak into your backpack and, yeah. and you, you read at recess, that would be, that's our goal. What, the way we see an illustration is that it's an island in the middle of words right and you you swim through the words and you get to this great illustration and lynn and i um uh even though sometimes we're not encouraged to are very um verbal uh very vocal about the illustration and how uh it is not exactly the um the idea that we have written and um, Ethan, our, uh, Ethan Nicole, our illustrator, has been very um, open to, um, and, and the result is, we, I, I love our book. Did, um, did you pick Ethan? Did Abrams, the publisher, pick Ethan? How, how did uh, the, the publisher, the publisher. Did, did Abrams give you like a choice or they yes. just said, oh, the, 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 here are like five and you got to pick one of the five or? Yes. Okay, yeah, they're really beautiful illustrations. That's so funny that you say, you know, Henry, when you say it's like the island and you have to swim through the words to get to the island, it made me feel like it brought me back to being a kid and going through that. Like, uh, and I'm specifically for whatever reason thinking about uh, Encyclopedia Brown uh, yes. stories when I was a kid. I remember, and I remember that feeling of, oh, an illustration, like a relief, even though it's not, you know, it's still fun and joy to read the words. You get to the illustration and, and there's, it's kind of just like a, a moment to relax, a, an island or an, an oasis. That's so funny. The other thing about those Encyclopedia Brown books is there were short chapters. Very short. There was big type. <laughs> and there was a question at the end of every chapter. You got to, you, there were mysteries, right? So you got to participate. So we try and do that too. We try and have cliffhanger endings. We use all the devices that you would use to try and encourage a kid 
to want to read, including cliffhanger endings, including playing around with the type. Some of the chapters in Alien Superstar are in screenplay form, which is really nice because there's a lot of white space on the page. So we're trying to think of, of, of not making it an uphill battle for kids, but making it smooth sailing so they can just enjoy the content. Tell One me of my favorite things yeah. was in uh, uh, in the Hank Zipser books, and and we we don't do it as uh, as much in the uh, in the Alien, but uh, in the Hank Zipser book, we wrote chapters that were literally a paragraph. So if a child had to read a chapter, they read a paragraph, and the rest was white. And thank you, and good night. <laughs> What what children's books um, do you guys remember reading when you were when you were kids? Well, we have very different answers for that. Henry, you go first. Okay, I read my first uh, actual book uh, when I was thirty-one, which was *The Clan of the Cave Bear*. I had the Hardy Boys. I tried. I I had to read uh, *The Tale of Two Cities* for for my high school. Uh, and the only thing I did, uh, I, I've said this before, I took water and I dripped it over the pages so they all crinkled up. So when I took out the book, it looked like I was beating it into submission. <laughs> and the only thing I read was the, the first line and the title. Yeah, well, that's all anybody knows of uh, A Tale of Two Cities anyway. Um, <laughs> And I was the opposite. I was I was a little nerd who sat who sat around reading books all the time. And I read I read uh, girls' fiction, and that was kind of hard to find in the in those days. I read Little House on the Prairie and Little Women and A Tree Grows in Brooklyn and Anne of Green Gables, and I read them over and over and over. I always wanted to be a writer, and so I loved those stories. I read the Nancy Drew books. But, uh, and then as I got older, maybe around 12, I jumped right into adult fiction. I remember reading Exodus when I was maybe 11 years old. I and saw just the movie. Sitting, yeah, well, it's a, a great movie. It was a great, just sobbing in my parents' living room. But I was, I was a real reader. And so it's interesting when we work together, Henry's references are mostly from theater because he's an avid theater goer and film and television. And mine come from books, so we put it together, and hopefully the collaboration produces something bigger than either one of us could do singularly. We That's hope. great. Let me do some more um, uh, audience questions. Um, so, well, first of all, here's well, let me, there was a there was a nice compliment here. Oh, here's one from Tara, mom of a smart, beautiful, dyslexic boy, grateful for your Hank books. That's sweet. That Thank must mean you. a lot. Thank great. you. Um, how many books will there be in this series? The grandkids love the Zipser books. Well, at the moment, there will be three. We've written two and we're at work on the third one, but you never know. You never know if there's, uh, if there's, uh, if, if they're very warmly welcomed. We tested this concept so that we could go on forever. But at the moment, there will be three. So Henry, I do have a question for you here about Barry, which I feel obligated to read since you did win an award, an Emmy award for it. Uh, and you are so fantastic uh, in Barry. And for those who don't know, uh, Barry is uh, a show on HBO in which uh, uh, a hitman played uh, uh, by uh, Will- uh, Ar Bill Hader. Bill, Bill Hader, sorry. Um, sure. It's been a long week and a half for me, so my brain's totally a little tired. <laughs> but Bill Hader um, goes to LA and ends up like learning how to act and be an actor. And Henry plays uh, Gene, right? Gene, who is a uh, kind of a, I, don't, I wouldn't call him a failed actor, but never achieved exactly what he wanted to, to be and is now a, an acting teacher. And it is, I don't think I've ever, I lived in Los Angeles briefly um, out of college. I went to film school at USC. And Henry, the, the, the way you captured this certain kind of, of Hollywood Los Angeles person, who is somebody who has talent, but never really got to where he wanted to go and takes himself very seriously. Uh, and yet also thinks he's like a really good person, but 
I don't, you know, is he a good person? Yes. A charlatan. Yeah. I mean, so it's such a, it's such a great character, but you obviously infused him with your own informed experiences and observations. Um, so here's a question from Gabe, uh, Gabriel Flores. How much did you add to your character of Gene on Barry? Absolutely love your character. And let me just say, it's a great question. And I completely agree. It's just not many people get to have two iconic characters, two iconic roles in their, in their life. And true. I think it's, you, you've now had, this is two and that's a lot. I'm knocking on wood. Yeah. You know, because we have not gone back to work yet. We finished Barry in uh, December of 2018. And I'm looking that we're hopefully going to start again in the fall uh, of 2021. So it's, but, you know, I had 14 teachers. I've heard about a lot of teachers here in LA. I took them all. And uh, I just uh, swallowed what I knew and out came uh, Gene Cousinow. Now he was written as a total bad guy. Uh -huh. And I didn't realize it, but once in a while I had some pity for the actor um, in my class who I was asking uh, to pay all of their uh, their uh, paycheck to me, you know, and it had to be in cash and it had to be on time. <laughs> and then they said, oh yeah, he could, he could be more uh, a warmer, more human fellow. And so together we just found our way. But I, I will say, if it is not on the page, it's not on the stage. And Bill Hader and Alec Berg are two unbelievable, really, uh, runners of, of show. They are great producers, writers. Bill is, a, uh, an, a, is an actor uh, on the show. It, it's amazing. It's great. And it, it is, it is um, the role, it reminds me of, of a few people I've met, and they tend to live in Los Angeles, which is bad people who think they're good people. Yeah, I think the country tilts and everybody who wants to be in show business slides in. Yeah. You know, there's nobody at the border saying, do you have any talent whatsoever? Just, hello. So I was just, so here's a question here about the font that you use uh, in the Hank Zipser books, using a special font for dyslexic kids. How did that font end up in your books? What's the story behind that? That's from a... Uh, Arla Bowers. Lynn, you want to handle that one? Sure. So Henry is holding it up now. So in our Here's Hank books, those are chapter books for kids of the first, second, third grade. We used a font called Dyslexi. And it's a, it's a font that was designed by a, a typesetter in the Netherlands who himself is dyslexic and he has two dyslexic kids. And so he developed a special typeface that makes the, the letters friendlier to the eyes and the brain of a kid who's dyslexic. So if you notice, here, Henry, hold it up. A hold it. If, yeah, I could go on. If you notice, the, the letting is farther apart between the letters. The words are set farther apart so they don't blend into each other. The, the ascending okay. strokes, like on a B and a D, go up higher, and the descending strokes go down lower. So, it, you know, dyslexic kids mix up Bs and Ds. And, so it actually makes it friendlier to the eye. Oh, that's so wonderful. I had no idea. Was in, our books were the first time this type was ever used in the United States. And it's it's such a logical thing. Why, of course, of course that would exist, but we were the first. Just wanted to show you the bad guy or bad lady <laughs> in our alien book. There she is, Citizen Cruel. Need I say more? <laughs> that's so funny. Let's see some more. Uh, uh, questions, and maybe we'll just do one or two more. Um, oh, somebody asked me how much sleep I've gotten over the past week. Not much, not much, <laughs> but, but that's okay. It's a privilege to be narrating uh, narrating this first draft of history as it happens. Um, can I ask a question about that? Sure. When you are home, 
when you're you've finished uh, your broadcast, uh, maybe you have time off, maybe it's the weekend. Is your phone by your side all the time so that you're on top of what's happening? Can yeah. you ever let it go? It's tough to uh, it's tough to let it go just because like even if I go on vacation, I'm going to have to be I'm going to have to get up to speed when I get back. Um, I'm also just like a news junkie. So even if I were, you know, uh, 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 an actor or producer or whatever or, or, or a writer, I would. I would be staying on top of the news this much. Um, so it's tough to, the, the weeks like this last week though are just crazy where it's just like, you know, I come home after everybody's asleep and leave before anybody wakes up kind of days. Those are just crazy one after the other after the other. And, you know, but CNN had it's like most, one of its most watched weeks ever. So, you know, we all just, we're all, it's not, yeah, there's, there's part of me that's like, can I just have a day off? But nobody's really asking for a day off. We all just work. And like, you know, the American people were, and people all over the world were just, they at the edge of their seats, they wanted to know what was going to happen. We still want to, we still want to know what's going to happen, but, uh, but to, a, le to a, a lesser extent. All right, let me just do one more, which is just, um, Henry, are you planning on narrating uh, the audiobook version like Ghost Buddies? Hillary yes. As a matter of fact, uh, I just read, this is the hardest thing I do in my entire life. I read um, our uh, Lights, Camera and Danger on, uh, on uh, CD, I can't say tape anymore. And Lynn and I uh, are, are, going, are just embarking on reading the 12 Here's Hanks. Uh, so Lynn will read six and I will read six. And Lynn, you know, is a, a wonderful reader. And for me, it takes me like days longer than anybody else. It just is sad. I, I sit in my car and weep on the way home. <laughs> anyway, I think, that's, I think that's all the time we have if we want to bring uh, politics and prose uh, back. Uh, Margaret, thanks so much. And, and Henry and Lynn, it was so fun and so lovely talking to you. And, and thank you so much for everything you do to bring pleasure to kids who need it. And especially to kids with learning differences who especially need it and especially need to be understood and to catered to, to a degree. And uh, I mean, it's just so lovely what you've done. And the exam, I mean, you've set an example, other people are going to follow your example. I don't understand why every kid's, uh, publisher doesn't use that special font. That sounds like a no brainer for everybody, for yes. every book. But can I just well, say um, on behalf of both of us, what a pleasure uh, to have you lead the conversation. And can I just say thank you for the last week because oh. you, you, <laughs> I've spoken to you a great deal. You probably didn't hear me, but you and I were, <laughs> were having great conversations all night long. So I feel I, very close to you. I had an epiphany the other night. I was talking to my wife and I realized that I was that the the tone that I was using during a lot of the broadcast was the tone that I use when I talk to one of my kids if they didn't do so great on a test or a quiz and I was just like all right this is what's going on because everybody wanted the election results no matter who you voted for everybody wanted the election results yeah. Tuesday night they wanted to know and it's just yeah. like okay this is what's going on you're going to get to take retake the test and like your grade will be the, you know, it was that kind of, I realized that's exactly the tone I took. This is what's going to happen. And then this is what's going to happen. We're all going to get through it together. It's going to be fine. We're going to have an answer. Um, so you know what, we as the audience need that because yes. it's true. By the time Saturday came around, you're sitting there. Now you're throwing marshmallows at the screen because <laughs> I don't want to buy a new TV, but you know, you're throwing things. It, it, you're like insane. It, yeah. it, uh, you know, so we need very clear, the, the, it's a, here's structure, in this structure is the freedom, we will all be let out, Yeah, it'll be fine. It's going to be fine, and this is where we're going, I tried to, and I tried to lean into it Saturday morning, I'm like, we think we're going to have a resolution of this, and we think it's going to come soon, everyone's, it's, we're, we're all going to be okay, we're all going to be okay, we're going to get through this together, and uh, anyway, and we did, although it's, some of us are still working through it, but it will, it'll all be okay. Yeah, but you know how we all felt so comforted by Walter Cronkite? You know, that was, that was the way it felt watching you. It felt like exactly like this, like, we are, like we're being held and supported through this time. So 
we feel, I feel, I've never met you, but I feel extremely close to you. And <laughs> you want to come for dinner tomorrow night? <laughs> well, thank you. It's an honor. Okay, Margaret, I'm sorry. All right. Well, no, thanks. Thanks to all three of you. You know, um, thanks, Jake, for taking the time tonight and uh, hope you do get some sleep and rest soon. Um, and Henry and Lynn, thank you so much for sharing about the series. And, and um, we're just so pleased that you could be here with us tonight and tell us more about it. Uh, don't forget, audience, thank you for coming. And um, the books, uh, the, the uh, link uh, to purchase the books is in the chat. And you can always uh, get the books through our bookstore, either online or phoning or stopping in. We're, we're open at all three locations now. Um, and you can follow uh, other wonderful events like this um, by going to our Politics and Prose website and seeing what's up. Uh, and I think that's that about wraps it up. Um, again, thanks, thanks to our panelists for being here, our authors, and um, stay safe and uh, keep and healthy, everyone. Healthy.